Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to this first session of this new TechNet 21 webinar series on temperature monitoring, keeping a cold chain cold. Today, I'm pleased to welcome our guests who are going to discuss where are we with temperature monitoring of cold chain. Um, we have with us today Jaya Nafunka, Nanfunka, Project Manager I, uh, at uh, Gavi, and uh, I am uh, CCOP for Cold Point. Um, Ranjit Diman, Supply and Logistic Manager at UNICEF, and Wendy Prosser, who, get, who made us the, own, the honor to wake up super early because she's in Seattle. So good morning, Wendy. And she's a Senior Technical Advisor at JSI. You can ask your questions during the presentation in the Q&A box or in the chat box. They will be answered by the panelists after the presentation. As uh, usual, uh, this session is recorded and we'll share the links to the videos uh, to the video, sorry, as well as the slides by email and on the TechNet 21 website. I will share the link uh, in the chat box during the presentation. Um, Ranjit, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex, and greetings to everyone all over the globe. Um, it's, a, <clears throat> it's an opportunity for all of us to uh, get together and um, discuss this important topic of temperature monitoring and where are we with uh, temperature monitoring of cold chain. Um, I would really start from, uh, you know, the basic questions, what is temperature monitoring? Uh, the answer is it's monitoring of vaccine from point of entry in the country to point of administration. This is really end to end monitoring of temperature uh, to ensure the, uh, you know, two important questions is vaccine okay? Or if not, do I need to do any intervention to check the quality? If there are alarms, should I be doing something to improve the quality of the vaccine or to check? Should I be doing to, to ensure that the, the quality is adequate to go ahead? Or the fridge is okay. Do I need to do some intervention to improve the functionality or to prevent um, a disaster of uh, <clears throat> vaccine going uh, out of range for longer period of time? So what we do, what do we monitor? We monitor cold rooms, uh, we monitor everything basically that stores the vaccine, cold boxes, refrigerators, and vaccine carriers. So that's, that's the whole end-to-end -end, uh, temperature monitoring aspect. Uh, so why it is important? Uh, we all know this classic chart on the left, uh, sensitivity of vaccine. We know it's not just uh, we have we have many vaccines in 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 program. This is a bit outdated chart, but then we have uh, you know new vaccine coming in into the program. We now see there is a uh, there are vaccines for COVID nineteen which needs to fit into this chart. Uh, there are the vaccine which are which requires ultra cold chain, for example, as on today, and then there are obviously vaccines which are less sensitive to freezing, and there are more sensitivity to freezing so it's it's really it's really going down the range now today is minus 80 minus 70 to plus 2 to 8 and that's where we need to be careful on which vaccine to keep where so that's the importance of monitoring and to know where to keep what uh, when we do the monitoring we do it for quality of vaccine we do it to monitor the fridge performance and to do targeted intervention and the end result of course is quality cold chain and safety of vaccine. That's that's what we are aiming for. Um, this is just to, you know, as, as this is an introductory uh, session. So we are touching upon basics of uh, how do we how do we monitor temperature breaks, for example, I'm not I'm not talking about thermometer. This is where how EPI program started to monitor the the refrigerators with the with a thermometer inside and uh, now we the range has gone wide. Uh, we are using central temperature monitoring systems for cold rooms. These are centralized systems. We have RTM, remote temperature monitoring devices, which can be used for cold rooms and refrigerators. We have 30 DTRs, 30 day temperature recorders. These are now, um, <clears throat> uh, this is a standard guideline for, for refrigerators to, to, to use this device. Uh, we have freeze indicators. This is essentially used for shipping and, and, and monitoring if, if there is instance of freezing. And uh, of course we have VVM, which has played a huge role, massive role in saving the vaccine and saving 
you know ensuring the potency um, is 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 uh, is 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 monitored by by health workers before vaccinating uh, children and adults so um, so who now you know moving one step ahead who does monitoring and why uh, we know classically as on today we have health work health workers who are working at the national and subnational level we have frontline workers these are frontline vaccinators um, so this this um, uh, you know a workforce is monitoring temperature for the sake of checking the vaccine daily basis routine monitoring and recording it for compliant purposes um, during the storage of vaccine and during the transportation so whenever vaccine arrives and stores it is kept in the store for a, for a, for a x duration of time it's the health workers and vaccinators who record the temperature on daily basis and they are the one who uh, monitor the temperature and flag any intervention needed to either supply chain managers or cold chain technicians or supervisors we also have uh, supply chain managers these are supervisors also uh, in the, uh, the if uh, if we talk about subnational level or uh, health facility level we have doctors medical doctors uh, we have uh, epi supervisors anyone who is visiting the health facility uh, they monitor temperature as well for quality assurance purposes and intervention what intervention is needed to to improve the cold chain further and then we also have cold chain technician they need to monitor the cold chain as well they need to look at the temperature data to to get a sense of you know how the fridge is uh, is is operating um, ideal world they should have access to remote temperature monitoring data to look at the fridge health and the, the, look at the past performance of the fridge and say you know what what really happened and get a sense of it and he also monitor the dashboard to see what is going on and to do targeted intervention apart from that this temperature monitoring data is very useful remote temperature monitoring data as well as any form of data which is recorded and reported uh, formally uh, to be used by manufacturers of the fridges and pqs secretariat for quality you know point of view to see if uh, to if if the fridge is performing to its standards are there warranty issues for example with ccop we have 10 years warranty now for the fridges and the rtm data is becoming and or any other any other form of temperature monitoring data is very critical in in pointing out to the um, to the warranty issues and uh, repairs um, and and address any repairs um, then comes the next basic question of when do we monitor the data so of course one instance is uh, of course every single device which is used for storing the vaccine could be cold room or refrigerator or a freezer or ultra freezer uh, the mandate still remains same twice a day manual recording uh, the essence of this twice a day manual recording is really visiting the the device uh, visiting the fridge and uh, do a visual inspection um, check the quality uh, check check if there are visual uh, indications of door open for example or and then monitor the temperature record the temperature on a sheet for compliance purposes this becomes a record of the fridge uh, in case any backtracking required for any reason there is an official record of how the fridge was 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 maintaining temperature over past few days this is mandatory also we have rtmd as we discussed and central temperature monitoring devices they record temperature every one hour um, and then this is uh, recorded and shared over, over over cloud through internet um, to the dashboard um, when to monitor also it's a question for supervisors so they need to see daily records they need to review weekly records um, sign temperature review reports uh, any action needed uh, ensure that the action is taken and recorded in the temperature review report and a counter signed by it and the report is counter sound by a supervisor that the job is done um, this temperature monitoring data when we as we stepped into the world of remote temperature monitoring devices we have dashboard available um, this dashboard essentially is could is is reflecting the temperature monitoring uh, you know data of all the instances in the country so at, in, at, at, at one point of time at one place somebody need to look at it at the national level sub-national level 
and see uh, which fridge is uh, requiring intervention and do, do targeted intervention. And that's also essential for supply uh, cold chain technician. Um, I would pass on uh, to, to Wendy to take the session from here on how do temperature monitoring system differ by supply chain level and shipments. Wendy, over to you. Thank you, Ranjit. Um, so we'll give a, a quick overview of the technology that's now available for temperature monitoring. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna get into the details of each of the technologies. Um, one exciting thing that's happening is that there are new innovations. The cold chain equipment is now more reliable um, and temperature monitoring devices are also more interactive, um, pushing data and you can actually see what's happening not only at the facility level, but at higher levels of the supply chain. So next slide. Great. At the central level, so this is mostly the national regional level walk-in cold rooms, um, these different monitoring systems that have multiple sensors to monitor hot and cold spots. It's continuous monitoring, it's software enabled, it's, um, it has built-in alarms, either the audible ones and the, the SMS text alerts, so you get that, and it pushes data to a dashboard, so then you can be monitoring it um, from far away, from next door, from the building next door, but you always have access to that data. I'm sure most people are familiar with these devices and already have them engaged in your, um, your walk-in cold rooms. The next slide. Um, the remote temperature monitoring devices, these are the newest technology out there. Um, they're designed for refrigerators. They can have single or multiple sens sensors. Um, you can have single device for multiple refrigerators while you're looking at it. Um, it's remote access. It's connected through a SIM card or Wi-Fi. Um, these devices, they, they have the built-in ones that come with the um, cold chain equipment itself or the um, external ones that are installed um, and the, it sends the data to the dashboard for, for uh, easy monitoring. One great thing about this is those the alerts immediately on the SMS to drive immediate action, and then the dashboard that can um, monitor over time and plan for maintenance, long-term uh, planning for that. And next slide. 30-day temperature recorders, the 30 D, uh, DTR, Fridge Tag 2, I'm sure also everyone is very familiar with these. Um, monitored for uh, monitoring a single refrigerator. It's a digital device. It shows the current temperature for daily, daily monitoring. You can also download the reports to send it to your um, the chain of command up the hierarchy. Um, the visual indicator is there for the alarms for the past 30 days. And then this downloadable um, data for reporting. And this, I think everyone is very familiar with these devices. They're um, available widely, they're part of CCOP, they're part of just the daily monitoring system, and they're reliable, and you can get the data immediately, and then this reporting function to be more formal in your reporting. And then the next slide, the shipping indicators. Um, this is for the shipping, typically from the manufacturers. Um, a single use, 10 days, um, often for the manufacturers into the point of entry. There's also a, a similar um, log tags with the freeze indicators. Um, to indicate if they've been exposed to freezing. Additionally, I wanted to mention um, with the ultra cold chain equipment that's uh, being rolled out now, there are different RTMD devices there uh, that are included in the UCC on shipment, and then some additional ones that you can add into um, after shipment and such to track the UCC temperatures that we all know are a bit uh, different and a bit challenging. Um, one thing I also, oh, and then the user programmable data loggers. This is uh, the data loggers, and, and these are used mostly for conducting the temperature monitoring studies in the walk-in cold rooms um, that tracks different within the cold room itself, the different hot and cold points to make sure it's uh, to better plan where the vaccine should be stored within there. And if there needs to be any adjustment on the, the uh, equipment itself. One thing that we really wanted to focus on in this series is that all of these devices give data, you still have to use the data and you still have to have that human aspect that's, that's monitoring the data, that's then looking at the dashboard, that's then actually reacting if there's a maintenance issue or the small tweaks that need to 
just close the door or replug the fridge or it needs a defrost or to clean off the solar panels. All this data can be extremely useful. We've seen some great examples that we'll go over in the next few weeks about how this data can drive decisions and drive maintenance issues and make sure the equipment is working really well. Um, next slide. The temperature monitoring systems, there's a whole um, web page and, and more information on the PQS uh, catalog with all the different temperature monitoring devices. Um, we, again, we'll be going into these details over the next few weeks um, with what's available. I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with all these and what's working for your system um, and keeping in mind that it, new technology is coming out. And with that, we can learn and we can continue to, to expand our temperature monitoring systems to make sure equipment is working well. Next slide, I'm gonna to pass to Jalia. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. So um, in the previous session, you've had um, a presentation around, you know, why temperature monitoring is important and, um, you know, why we need to do it when we need to do it and, and the roles and responsibilities for the different stakeholders. In this section, we're focusing mainly on the challenges, um, the opportunities that are uh, on the horizon that countries can take, can leverage and take advantage of, and then um, really look at the way forward for the next um, webinar series till the end of the year. So we're going to highlight some of the challenges that we are seeing in temperature monitoring, and you might have come, come across this. One is the fact that um, increasingly, um, we are seeing more investments in equipment, but also in vaccines within countries, but there's less emphasis on the performance or monitoring performance of these investments. Now, if you take, for example, um, you know, the CCOP platform that was um, established in 2016, um, a lot of equipment has been uh, procured to date, over 65,000 units. Um, that has been uh, procured that is going into countries. This doesn't exclude anything that countries are jointly investing in or does jointly investing in using different resources. But also when you think about the pandemic context, more than 25,000 units have been procured um, by UNICEF supply division since the start of the year to date for the pandemic uh, or for the COVID response. So you tend to see that increasingly countries are investing more and more into, um, into equipment and vaccines. And so the risk is getting much higher. But also when you're looking forward into the next, uh, into this current strategic period, there are different avenues for countries to invest. But given the fact that there's less a systematic um, monitoring of the performance of the equipment and using or closing the feedback loops to, um, to the different manufacturers in terms of um, the changes we need to make, but also using the data for key decisions around maintenance, then that is one of the challenges um, that, that we are finding in this space. How are we using the temperature data to make the decisions or to support decisions uh, within countries and look, looping back with the alliance and manufacturers? The other challenge we've also um, observed is around um, underutilization of the data, all the technologies that currently exist. Now, when we talk about the investments that have been done to date, um, a lot of the countries have invested in either, you know, the integrated devices, uh, integrated remote temperature monitoring devices, the 30 DTRs, or even the standalone devices. A lot, a lot of the data is available at, um, at, at the last mile or with the end users for decision making. But in some cases, especially for remote temperature monitoring devices, countries don't have access to the platforms or the dashboards to make use of that data, or at the lowest level where data is, um, is available. This data doesn't make its way up yet. There are some innovations and technologies that support that. So in the next sessions, we'll be looking at, uh, at some of that, but limited access to the data or use of that data makes it um, difficult to, to be able to use that data. And then making sure that we are aware or documenting what it, how we are translating this data or how we are linking this temperature data to maintenance and how we are driving action, there is still some challenge around that um, using the data to drive action. Next slide, please. The other one I think is also the fact that with the different funding levels that are available to countries, um, you know, it could be CCO, PHSS, donor resources, government funds, a lot of investments have gone into the temperature monitoring, uh, temperature monitoring space. And the beauty is that countries can enjoy different systems that offer different features, that offer different capabilities. 
the one challenge that brings um, again is the fact that now you have different systems that exist within um, countries data uh, data systems and specifically we're talking about RTM systems so how do countries then um, support or how do countries uh, then review performance of their equipment when they have different platforms within um, within with within within the country. So there is that lack of integration uh, of the data that already exists within countries. So that remains a challenge in terms of you know comprehensively do countries um, where they have access to um, this temperature monitoring data can they uh, comprehensively um, assess or evaluate the performance of their their equipment? Is the equipment um, in the right condition to be able to uh, to to um, to store the vaccines at recommended temperature ranges, and some of this data is not making its way into um, into the existing platforms, the LMI systems, the ELMI systems, and some of the bespoke systems that countries do have at their disposal. And the last challenge here is also the fact that um, you know we're seeing more and more developments in the RTM space. Uh, we've talked about data use, but specifically, um, I think. The access to that data remains a challenge. The health worker capabilities to be able to use that data. You know, data is, um, at the end of the day, if data is available, uh, are, are users or healthcare workers able, or, or technicians able to use the, um, the available data to inform maintenance decisions? Or rather um, think about the investments that they are making uh, based on the field performance data that they have. And the other challenge specifically around remote temperature monitoring devices is obviously the high cost of the data and, and, and portal subscriptions, but some of these do create barriers to, to, to scale where countries may be interested in, in scaling up some of this. So we will have sessions around you know, the 30 DTRs in the next sessions, but um, you know, these are some of the challenges that we've seen or we've come across. And so next slide, please. I wanted to also highlight some of the um, opportunities that um, you know are on the horizon that countries would be able to take advantage of um, to, to to improve their immunization programs. One, uh, we're seeing better uh, better or improved uh, shelf life in some of the devices out there. Specifically, when we're talking about the, the 30 DTRs, so if we have a longer shelf life, it, it has good implications for countries in the sense that re replenishment of these devices or replacement of these devices, um, you know, becomes a lot easier. It becomes a lot, uh, probably a lot less costly within a, a particular strategic period. But again, the challenge is around um, data use. That the use of that data at country level still remains. So, um, the system strengthening aspects of 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 of, of um, of, of data need to be in place uh, to support uh, the decisions that need to be made. The other is around the new innovations, and we'll talk more about this in the coming sessions, the innovations that are in the pipeline to support um, equipment performance uh, monitoring. And specifically, we're talking about the equipment monitoring systems. And, and you know, in the next session, speakers will talk more about that and, and, and share more about that. But again, beyond temperature, these systems are offering you know, more monitoring capabilities beyond temperature. Are we able to monitor the performance of our, uh, uh, of our equipment? Can we be able to tell uh, exactly what is wrong with the equipment as it is deployed in different um, contexts? And so the other is definitely around um, with the you know, with the with the in the recent past, we've seen more investments in the remote temperature monitoring devices, and and I think in particular when we talk about the pandemic and, and the need to make sure that um, and the need to make sure that the 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 challenges that the vaccine presents, uh, the need to make sure that as the vaccines go through the pipeline, the temperatures are effectively monitored. We've seen uh, an increase in in investments in RTMD especially at the higher levels of the supply chain. So this is an opportunity in the sense that um, it will enable at least uh, in, in the interim for countries to strengthen, um, you know, how they use data supply uh, at the highest level of the supply chain where a bulk of the vaccines are, uh, are kept and resources are uh, tend to be more available than the lower level, um, than the lower level sites. But uh, again, using the data to be able to inform maintenance decisions, identify where issues um, are within the supply chain. So this, that is an opportunity. Then um, uh, one slide back, please. Yes, and then the other we've talked about um, being able generally to build that culture of using data to, um, to inform maintenance decisions, uh, irrespective of where that data sits within, within the country. Next slide, please. 
And so when we're talking about the report, just to highlight some of the upcoming sessions, this session was really providing more of an overview and, and what the key priorities are as we move into the next webinar sessions. So we have four sessions scheduled for end of year, one that is focusing on 30 details and really digging into you know, the country success stories, as well as the overview of those devices, the RTMBs, um, again, success stories. We've talked about the future of, of, of temperature monitoring, which is on December 2nd, but we'll talk about the equipment monitoring systems. And, and then um, the wrap-up session, which is really um, trying to connect that dots with everything that we've seen over the, um, uh, all the webinar series, how we, how we connect that to, um, you know, improving coaching systems and maintenance practices, of course. Um, and, and Wendy has already shared the, um, some of the resources that can be uh, accessed for temperature monitoring, but here's another link um, that, that on, on TechNet that um, can be leveraged to dig more into the, dig more into the temperature monitoring space and we'll share a report uh, uh, regarding the webinar series at the end at the end of the webinar series, but uh, I'll hand over to Wendy and for, 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 for questions and answers. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jaya. Um, and we've seen a lot of great questions coming in. Thank you, we'll um, keep those coming. Um, I know some have been answered in the chat, but it'd be, I think it'd be great to discuss them as well. So um, I will just start going through those and then, and please keep sending in your questions. If we can't answer them today, there will be other opportunities in the coming webinars if they're more specific to different um, topics, all right? Um, so let's start with the dial thermometers and stem thermometers. If Ranjit, if you could give a bit of insight into those. Um, I, 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 I don't see the question in the list uh, on, on dial or stem, it but the idea is, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so the idea is these, um, uh, you know, now now we are moving ahead with 30 DTR as one mandatory temperature monitoring device in the fridge. And one of these need to stay in the fridge as a backup uh, device, just in case 30 DTR is uh, out of battery or malfunctioning. So then it's just uh, one backup device to, to check temperature. But now the guidelines is to have 30 DTR as one standard temperature monitoring device. Great, thank you. Um, this, another question came in that I think is super interesting and Jalia, I think you'll have some um, good insight into that. The question was many countries by local laws promote locally manufactured CCE. What's the role of WHO and UNICEF to improve the capacity of local companies to meet the PQS? Um, so Jalia, can we start with you from the CCOP and the Gavi perspective on this and market shaping and such? Thanks, Wendy. And I think, uh, given that Karuna is uh, Karuna is uh, represented in this call for the market shaping, I'll hand it over to her for a presentation on market functions. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Do we have Sorry. Do we have Karuna? Oh yeah, here. All right. Hey. I, I got the panelist link, so I'm here. Um, so yeah. So in terms of promotion of locally manufactured CCE, so so far. Most of the CCE that is pre-qualified by WHO is not manufactured in many of the countries that we serve. So it's primarily manufactured in India and then as well in China and a, and a few other European and American countries. So this is a good question. And it's also coming up heavily on, on the side of vaccines and not just for cold chain equipment. And so this is something that we're really starting to think about as we, you know, as we develop the 5.0 strategy. But I would say sort of in terms of what our role would be, it's to make sure, so whether it's Gavi or UNICEF or WHO, it's to look at what is the capability in different countries to perform the PQS testing. So often access to a PQS certified laboratory can become a bottleneck to countries that wish, or companies that wish to bring their products through pre-qualification, um, regardless of where that company is situated. So that's one. And then I think secondly, it's, it's um, making sure that all of the standards and specifications that exist are well known by the different companies out there. So at Gavi and, and I know also PQS and, and with UNICEF, when we're in touch with different suppliers, whether or not it is a uh, sort of a new innovative supplier or one that is um, already has established products for other markets, we really focus on helping them understand what is the process to go through to get PQS certification, what are the standards that they need to meet. and um, and to, to basically give some guidance so they can go through that process and make that decision to go through. So I think because of WHO and, and UNICEF and Gabby's stance on wanting pre-qualified products, that that's probably the most important thing that we can do is make sure that suppliers understand that capacity or understand that the pathway to, um, 
tuber qualification. And then I think secondly, the other thing that's important is the demand side, right? So it, it's not just a market dynamic. So the products might be available, but there might be low uptake. So it's, it's also, um, we're also looking at ways that we can also ensure that programs are aware of what are all their product options and become more familiar with brands and products that they may not already know about. Because, you know, it's one thing to get the product available, but if there's no uptake, then there's not really an incentive for local suppliers to continue to innovate and bring products to market. Um, Jalia, anything else you'd want to add to that? Uh, no, thanks, Corona. That's sufficient. Thank you. Thanks so much for that insight, Karuna. <clears throat> and great that you're on this call. Thank you. Um, there was another question on uh, using NextSleep RTMs um, for walk-in cold rooms, and Ranjit already responded to that, that they can be used for the walk-in cold rooms. It does have five sensors um, that can be scattered across the walk-in cold room, so they are effective in those situations. Um, I'm going to switch to another question that came in on the interoperability of RTMD dashboards that I do think is, is so important right now, especially with the, the different um, types of RTMDs that are getting installed in countries, both the built-in and then these add-ons like a NextSleep thing. Um, can we, and I see that Ranjit uh, has responded to that and Karuna, you're gonna be on the hotspot again um, for the EMS and any kind of interoperability of RTMD dashboards to enable easy access by national and subnational officers that might have several devices by different manufacturers. If you have any thoughts on that. Sure, so this is also another area that's becoming really increasingly important. So we obviously recognize that countries will have multiple brands in, um, in use. And we also, actually, from a market shaping perspective, really feel that diversification is important um, depending on the, the country context. So, Currently, the, the situation is that there isn't necessarily a standard for all of the RTMD data that exists. So it it's actually requires quite a bit of back-end reconfiguration by the supplier for the data to be formatted to go to another platform. So we've seen this when some of the data needs to flow into a new ELMIS platform or other, uh, other sort of system, or on the Gavi site also for IMPT. So going forward, the, the best way to address this is actually the new EMS specifications that are coming up, which include data standards. And so there's also discussion within PQS around applying these, this stand, like these data standards so that all the data would be formatted and then structured in a specific way and have an open API that would allow the data to be able to flow from an RTMD um, platform into an ELMIS so that a country would be able to manage all of the performance data from their different devices, regardless of which supplier it is, in one place with the system of their choosing. Um, so this is something that is still in works. I, th I think it's more of a future vision. So right now, a lot of the existing products do require some backend reconfiguration. In the future, there still may be a little bit of, of things that need to be done behind the scenes to get it set up, but it won't be such a heavy lift as it currently is. And, and that's, that's where we wanna see things go. Great, and there's also building on that. There's also um, a movement to to integrate the RTMD data into existing ELMIS systems. So it's one system that um, uh, EPI can go to for managing all aspects. Um, I would also add to I think on the 30 DTR side, there's at least two apps out there, and I know this will be talked about next week that can also have the data to be in a format that could be sent into ELMIS. Thank you for that plug. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, you also mentioned IMPT. Jalia, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the IMPT. Thanks, Wendy. Yes. Um, so IMPT stands for the Intelligent Maintenance and Planning Tool. And really, it, um, it is a web-based uh, platform that uh, accepts uh, remote temperature monitoring data from uh, either equipment that is um, equipped with uh, integrated uh, remote temperature monitoring devices or, or just from standalone, um, standalone RTMDs. And the purpose is really to make sure that um, we, uh, the, the, make, the, the purpose of that tool is to make sure that um, we have a sense of, all countries have a sense of the uh, field performance of the equipment that is already dis uh, deployed. So, Right, I more mainly focuses on temperature data, using that as a proxy for understanding whether um, a particular mix, uh, whether particular mix and models of equipment are performing well within that particular co context. 
with the purpose of just making sure that um, where issues are identified, whether they're maintenance issues or management issues within countries, uh, countries can take a lead on, on, on addressing those issues. If it is, um, you know, product specific challenges, and then that means that um, the, the alliance and manufacturers can work based on the field performance, the actual field performance data. So it's one of those ways to close the feedback loops between, you know, what is happening at country level and what is um, and the role that the alliance and, and manufacturers can play in, in closing those gaps. Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Um, Let's move. There were a couple questions on 30 DTRs. Ranjit, I'm going to put you in the hot spot. A couple related to the shelf life and the potential of, of changing out batteries or having a different technology with that. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's it, it, uh, this also brings one news to for for everyone uh, that the um, uh, there's a new model of 30 DTR from Berlinger. It, it's um, it's FT2E, which, which has five year life. And in fact, the old model of uh, uh, FT2 uh, is no more intended to be produced from next year onwards. So it's going to be five-year battery from now on. Um, so that's one. Um, and then the other question on battery, uh, why 30 DTRs do not come with replaceable battery? The answer is it's one of the PQS requirement that uh, the device should not lose its calibration, should not lose the data. So any intervention that can interfere with uh, with, with either of those um, um, is not is not preferred. So that's why it's, it's made very strict. The user should not be able to replace the battery. Thank you. And so I think from a practical standpoint, that means ministries of health have to always be planning for replacement of the 30 DTRs and uh, the same thing with the cold chain equipment you have to plan from 10 to 12 years out what right. your needs are and be able to put that in your budget right. and then the practical aspect of changing out those devices that we know is a lot of effort um, yeah. that can be planned for absolutely um, so there was a question on the VVM for the COVID-19 vaccine that's that's also the hot topic I honestly don't have a heads up on that. Uh, we mm -hmm. are hoping uh, news comes soon. Um, no, I don't have it. Anyone else on panel have it? Mm -mm. Uh, no. I haven't heard anything. I know it's a, it's super important because especially with the um, challenges and the different temperature requirements of the vaccine, but I've not heard anything from the manufacturers of what, uh, of any change to the, um, to the characteristics of it. Um, there's a great question on what is the role of the store officer in the management of temperature? Um, and this is more like the nuts and bolts of what you do on a daily basis. Ranjit, you had some questions and invite others to add to that too. <clears throat> yeah, so I responded. It's uh, so the store manager, it, uh, you know, the role is obviously to review the temperature data, to uh, point out uh, any intervention needed, coordination with technician, replacement of temp uh, 30 DTR or, or any, any temperature monitored device that, that is due for replacement. So it's really, it's really one level up of, uh, of, uh, of that of a health worker, for example, the, the frontline worker who records the temperature, who monitors the temperature. Store manager has one level up responsibility of ensuring it, uh, the, um, the coordination with different agencies, for example. <clears throat> I would add to that also the practical aspect of if a fridge is going down, they move the vaccine somewhere else, right? There's a, yeah. a lot of basics in which often happens. Um, and that's one of the things about using the data. It, if you see a fridge is not working, sitting at the national level of the, of the health system, you may think that those vaccines are going bad, but often health workers are responsive and will move the vaccine somewhere else. And, but it's having that insight into things that is so important when you're looking at the overall system of, of what's actually happening in a practical sense. Um, there was a question on the temperature monitoring devices if they have a certificate of calibration. Great question. Yeah, so it's um, so when when a device is PQS pre qualified and um, it is certified for its life, that's what I would say. We all PQS temperature monitoring devices are certified for its life. Um, yeah, so the new devices which have a life of five years or three years, there is a calibration guarantee of those. Of that period, and in case it, and in case it is not, it is the responsibility of field to bring that into to the attention of PQS so that uh, this can be addressed. 
Mm. Um, could you speak a little bit more about how you bring that into the attention of PQS? Um, yeah, it's normally either through, um, yeah, uh, either through UNICEF channel or uh, I'm sure we can share the, uh, the email address of PQ Secretariat where such information can be shared. But then if it, uh, uh, UNICEF being the procurement agency for many cases, uh, the frontline information need to come to us and we take it to supply division, UNICEF supply division, which is procurement uh, agency and uh, they coordinate with the uh, PQS secretariat and manufacturers. Great. So there is a feedback loop on devices and how they're functioning. If there's any issues with the manufacturing of it, same thing for cold chain equipment. Um, and more feedback, I think, I, I think it's safe to say more feedback on how the devices are functioning is always welcome as we're always trying to improve the functionality of the devices. Sure. I think that's safe to say. Um, a good question. When we did EVM assessment frequently, we found old cold chain equipment, including TMD at that time is categorized as PQS devices. But if using the latest list of PQS devices, it's no longer on that list. Um, do those equipment, are they still considered a PQS equipment or not? Interesting. Um, so when a product is taken off uh, PQS qualification, it is, it is taken off for a reason. And that reason is valid for all the shipments which have gone out. So to my, uh, my answer is if, uh, if the pre-qualification is no more valid, uh, the device should not be considered as PQS anymore. But that, that's, that's a complicated issue. I know for, even for CCOP applications, when we say, uh, do uh, you know we need to categorize PQS and non-PQS and so certain units which were considered PQS at the time of procurement now it is not it throws some sort of um, negative light on planning of the country that why do you have so many you know PQS non-PQS units but the essence is um, yeah if the qualification is taken off uh, it's taken off for a reason and better find the reason we need to know the reason why it is taken off and that reason is applicable I can add to this as well. So sometimes the, the equipment may no longer be pre-qualified because the manufacturer has dis discontinued making it because they've made a new model. So it may not necessarily reflect that the, there's something wrong with the equipment. It may just mean that the manufacturer has a new upgraded model and is choosing not to produce that model anymore or choosing not to renew its pre-qualification. So you shouldn't necessarily assume there's a problem with the equipment. As Ranjit was saying, it's best to get clarity as to why that specific equipment is no longer considered pre-qualified. Great. And assuming also if you're doing quality temperature monitoring to make sure the fridge is, is functioning, that might be if you have to um, prioritize where you want a more interactive RTMD, maybe that those types of equipments are where you're doing more close um, monitoring. Could you speak, could someone speak about the decommissioning process and the guidance that's available for equipment that is no longer in use? Question, Wendy. It's an open question to everyone, eh? Well, yes. <laughs> Anyone who has an opinion, I have opinions too. Go ahead, Wendy. Maybe you start then. <laughs> <laughs> There's there is some UNICEF has some guidance on decommissioning old equipment. Um, we have seen that that is a, a a significant challenge for countries, especially with all this new CCOP equipment coming in. Um, there's got to be a plan to decommission, and sometimes those the old equipment can be taken apart to use for spare parts for example, or, um, but there are special specific processes to decommission an old piece of equipment to get it out of the system. And there's guidance out there. Again, it has to be planned for, uh, has to be budgeted for, has to be done in consideration with new equipment coming in like through CCOP. Did you have something, anything to add? No, oh, that's, uh, that's, that sums up. Um... Um, yeah, pretty much. There were also discussions around uh, how do we loop, loop back uh, 30 DTRs, for example, back to back to manufacturers. And that's that's one one recycled you know, mechanism that need to set up. Come on. That's great. Yep. Um, there's a question on what happens during emergency supply or receiving a cold chain items and the store officer finds out the fridge to store the kit is not working. So you get a top up of supply and the fridge is not working. What do you do? 
Yeah, so that's contingency. That's that's precisely what contingency plan is. And this is what should be laid out black and white in E3 section. This is when we do VM assessment, there is a section on contingency planning. Um, and it's a critical question in, uh, in EVM assessment and uh, each store should have their own contingency plan. And what it lists out is precisely a situation like this. If your fridge is not working, what do you do with the vaccine? Uh, do you ship it to somebody else, you know, somewhere else, nearby health facility? Do you send it back to the one level up? Uh, do you uh, source local ice and use cold box? Uh, all those is part of contingency plan. So I would, I would really focus on contingency plan, which includes the phone number of decision-making people in case the facility is not, a, you know, the, the person in facility is not in um, authority of taking a decision related to vaccine. Great, very practical approach. I like that, thank you. Um, there's a question on the VVM. If the vaccine without VVM is exposed to heat more than 10 hours from the temperature logger, can it still be used or not? This is in line, I think you're asking the VVM question on uh, on, uh, on COVID-19 vaccine. It's, it's, it is COVID-19 situation. I don't think any other vaccine today unless it's procured, um, you know, government procured directly some vaccine and does not come with VVM. Otherwise, most vaccine in routine program comes with VVM, but yes, COVID-19 vaccine is a situation. Um, I would say um, temperature more than 10 hours uh, is not, is not alarm. It, it's, it's only alarming to take an action, uh, to, to, to be noticed that something is wrong with fridge or something is wrong with the temperature, uh, it does not mean that vaccine is gone. Uh, the good question is on the minus side. If you see minus five temperature in the morning, uh, that's 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 a critical one. What to do then? And we have a clear line there. Do the shake test. If the temperature is more than uh, eight degrees for ten hours, um, it's only it's only uh, you need to see at how much. It, I don't think we if we have a we will have a situation that the temperature would reach a super hot ambient of 45 degrees. It's it's if we do monitoring twice a day, the last monitoring says it's okay. The next monitoring says if you have a problem, um, we don't expect the temperature to go above 15 for any serious case unless the door was open and there's a serious heat wave. Um, so yes, uh, it's not in. It, it, it's certainly not an indicator that the vaccine is gone. But what is important is to know when the last monitoring was done. If this is noticed after a weekend and last monitoring was done three days ago, then it's a question. Temperature of vaccine is twenty-five degrees. Then it's a question. So um, yeah, it's it, it's it's again part of the uh, SOP which country need to decide when they use a vaccine without VBM, it has to be backed by a SOP fully endorsed by a government. Yeah. Great, and it also speaks to just the close attention that we have to be paying to for the, the COVID vaccines, especially with the dynamic labeling for Pfizer and really tracking and monitoring every step of the distribution of it until that point of administration in the arm. Um, these vaccines are very unique and they require special attention. And um, again, it just needs to be written into the SOPs and, and always um, emphasized during the uh, yeah. distribution. We had a couple of questions uh, that people um, suggested and asked as they were registering. One was specifically on a few actually address the rural health centers and how best to monitor temperatures in rural health centers um, and manage the cold chain in those areas. Uh, anyone have any question? Any thoughts on that? It, so it so when we say rural health center, this is probably the question is around when you don't have a fridge and vaccine okay. is taken for vaccination and brought back to health centers where from where it was taken. Yeah. Um, VVM is precisely meant for that, uh, and freeze freeze indicator need to go with the with the vaccine carrier. Um, uh, yeah. And then there has to be multi-dose vial policy standards put in place. Those protocols, when you take the vaccine out and bring it back, uh, those SOPs are well defined. What do you do? Where do you keep those vials with, when it is coming back so that it's it, there is a count on how many times it has left the health facility? Um, so we don't really need a temperature monitoring device for those vaccination centers. VVM plus freeze indicator should do the job. Great. Thank you. 
Um, another question also that um, registrants put in is the during transport and transit and how best to monitor um, temperatures and the cold chain during transportation. Very good question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we are now moving in the era of remote temperature monitoring and there are devices which are uh, which are uh, designed around temperature monitoring of uh, shipments. Um, so yes, go to PQS section, there are devices, um, one from Berlinger for sure. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, I don't recall what it calls, but then these are uh, Bluetooth enabled one. I don't even know whether it's PQS mm -hmm. pre-qualified yet, but there were discussions around. I have to check if it is pre-qualified. Pre mm -hmm. Also, I recall Nextleaf uh, were developing something around that. So I'm not sure uh, where we are, but then there are devices for sure. And uh, and then vaccine uh, refrigerated trucks, they often come with um, their own temperature monitoring system. Um, if nothing works, then 30 DTR is, plenty, is 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 a good device to be placed inside cold you know boxes and 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 monitors. You use them for temperature monitoring of shipments, especially. Um, and I I think one of the most important aspects of this many temperature monitoring studies have been done during transportation. Um, the the ones I've heard about that were maybe seven or eight years ago are. Um, notoriously bad for bad temperatures. Um, since then though, I think the equipment has gotten better, gotten more reliable. The temperature monitoring devices definitely have gotten um, better. I think Ranjit, you were alluding to the parcel devices and, and Nextleaf has a new device, the Trek device that they've tried out in a few places um, for specifically looking at transport. So it's, um, it's definitely an opportunity. There's new technology out there and also super important to track as well. And again, it's back to the human aspect, it's back to the technology and looking at the data to use it. Um, one other question has come in. What guidelines are available for temperature mapping of freezers and cold chain trucks? Um, the WHO guideline for temperature mapping doesn't cover those areas. Okay. Um... So mapping of cold room, uh, we need to understand first thing, uh, mapping of cold room is to, uh, because cold rooms are large and there are two or more cooling units in a cold room. Uh, the placement of vaccine uh, is essential where, and, 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 and it really depends on load of the cold room, where the hot spots are, where the cold spots are. And uh, that's where mapping comes into picture. Uh, to make sure that when a cold room is installed, both units are, are, are cooling adequately and none of them is dropping the temperature below desired. And uh, you know, um, in, in, in different situations, in, in loaded situation and in empty, empty situation. Uh, so that's where mapping is essential for cold, uh, for, for cold rooms. Uh, for shipping, uh, you know, trucks, um, the temperature has to be between, let's say four to eight and the distances and the time duration is is limited. Uh, yes, uh, even if we have mapping tool, what if you have you, you often have one 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 cooling unit and the uh, uh, and the guideline broad guideline is to really uh, make sure that temperature doesn't go below below two. It all it all depends on duration. See, see the whole game of mapping is around duration and shipping uh, trucks do not. Uh, require special mapping uh, cases, especially when how do we how do we how do we load them? Um, a care can be can be put in place at the time of loading the 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 uh, the, the, the trucks with uh, with with monitoring devices. There is there is no guideline because uh, duration of transport is is not enough to is not is is not long enough to be uh, to be mapped adequately. I mean, this is all I can say. And it sounds like it's very unique it's each situation is unique depending Absolutely. on the time to transport how you load the truck and everything um great thank you and then there was a follow-up question on the vaccines with no vvm um back on the hot spot ranjit does it mean that we shouldn't use hours of heat exposure for vaccines without vvm potency i think it's like is it's they're looking 
sounds like they're looking for guidance on specifically hours to heat exposure to vaccine usage. Uh, okay, so first of all, we cannot generalize for all the vaccine. Each vaccine has its own sensitivity. So if we really want to deep down, deep deep dive into, into without VVM story, it has to be by vaccine. Uh, the vaccine which comes with uh, with VVM 30 has a different guideline. The vaccine like OPV, which comes from VVM 2 has a different, different story. And there are published um, articles on temperature sensitivity of this vaccine and how quickly they lose potency. So we need to deep dive into that. And, uh, and 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 see what 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 durations are recommended uh, for taking action or loss of potency without VBM. So each vaccine different case. COVID nineteen, I still don't have answer for that. None of the manufacturers are responding to it. Um, avoiding the question, I think, is what they're doing. Um, <laughs> one last question, I think, and this came in before the sessions began. But I think it's relevant and sets us up for the next several sessions. How can we use, um, how can this data, real time or almost real time, help us improve on potency and make useful decisions? So, are there practical things that we've seen that can be done with the data coming in and where we can go with temperature monitoring? I can, I have a couple thoughts that, um, and then I'll open it to others. Um, a lot of the RTM data that's real time will actually drive decisions immediately, right? It says the alarm will go off. That means the door is open or the temperature is excursion. It has a temperature excursion because the fridge is accidentally unplugged. And so some of those things can really help um, that concrete action in the moment. The larger, longer term dashboard can help plan out with some um, a more analytics and predictive analytics. You can plan out what the maintenance needs are for the equipment for longer term. Um, but it is because we do have this new technology, we are getting more real time data. It can drive more immediate action to take. Um, again, I want, want to keep uh, focusing on the human aspect of this because data is great, but it's useless until you use it. And, and that, that human part of reacting to the data and then using it for planning for immediate reaction and for longer term planning, I think is the the most important part to actually getting can, uh, ensuring that the vaccines are potent. Um, do others, Ranji, Karuna, Jalia, have any final thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. So on this, uh, yeah, I was thinking about COVID nineteen specific response to this temperature problem. So I can I can quote what what was done in one country, for example, because this is a situation every country is struggling up. So there was an SOP developed in that country to say. We will use 30 DTR for COVID-19 monitoring, right? Uh, and then we will use RTM data, et cetera, everything end to end. And since the vaccine is going to be in the country from the time of arrival to the time of vaccination, it's not going to be more than 60 days. And it, it's going to be con consumed by that time. Um, uh, so the idea was to use 30 DTR. And uh, the SOP says that if you have an alarm, uh, raise a call to cold chain manager, go to cold chain manager, inform that there is an alarm, and uh, there is and 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 the SOP says that cold chain monitor uh, manager can actually uh, look at the stocks and say how much do you have, etc. Can it be replaced? And if it can be replaced, they would pull the stock back to to where uh, it can be stored with more efficient temperature, uh, like a, like a cold room or any other place. Replace the stock and keep the stock there till there is a you know, valid answer from 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 the manufacturer or the expiry date. So uh, since we this is an exception, it's not going to happen every day, every time. Uh, so this protocol was put in place. One instance of alarm, uh, I think more than 15 degrees of temperature. That's that's the condition. And of course, one instance of freezing and definitely it was out. The stock has to be taken off if it is freezing. But if it is more than ten, if it's a heat alarm, for example, more than fifteen degrees, yes, uh, this this protocol was followed. Okay. Thank you, um, Karuna Jalia. Any final thoughts? I will take silence as a no. Well, we just noticed that we're at time, so we think you guys yeah. have done a sufficient <laughs> job. Yes. Great. Thanks, Thanks Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. Thank you very much to everyone who um, participated. We will see you next week as this series continues.
This is excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the, for this really great presentation and for the all the the the, the, the engagement. Um, uh, this is this is great. Uh, as a reminder, we'll send you uh, we'll send everybody the the links to the to the recording and the slides by email. Uh, they will also be made available on the Technet Twenty One website. I already shared the link in the chat box, but I will send uh, the, the link by email as well. Um, if you want to know how to get the most of your real time temperature monitoring data, you should join us next week, same time, same place. Um, and uh, as you already registered for this session you will automatically receive a notification with the link to join the call. Thank you again. Uh, really, uh, that, was, uh, that was awesome. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Ranjit. Thank you, Kenya. And thank you, Karina, for joining. And uh, I wish you all a very nice uh, evening and rest of the day for Wendy, who is just starting now. Bye, everybody, and see you next week. Bye.